Hello and welcome. I hope that you are having a fantastic day today. We're going to talk about a wealth transfer. And this wealth transfer is happening because Bitcoin just kissed $20,000. What do I mean by kissed? Well, it hit $19,950. It came up $50 short of $20,000. So in my mind, Bitcoin just kissed $20,000 and we are about to see a massive wealth transfer. Now, this is what you're gonna watch in this video is my opinion, it's not financial advice. But I want to help you put some of that wealth in your pocket. You deserve to have some of that wealth today. So let's get right into it. All right. Now, my video, my YouTube channel, uh, Luminate, is here to give you ideas, ideas to help you take profits and avoid losses. Can we get this video to 99 likes? smash that like button. It really makes a huge difference for us. I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This is my opinion. So take it with a grain of salt. Do your own research. Read the rest of this paragraph. It has excellent advice when it comes to investing in cryptocurrency, but the truth is it'll work for any kind of investment. Now, the wealth transfer has already begun and we already have at least one year, <clears throat> one year of proof of what's going on. On January 1, 2020, Bitcoin was selling for $7,174 and on December 1st, that's today, 2020, Bitcoin hit that new all-time high, well, almost hit the new all-time high of $20,000 or greater. It hit $19,950. That gives us a percentage growth year to date of 278%. That's 278%. So that is significant in terms of any investment. Any investment that makes you 278% in less than one year that is substantial. Now, why is Bitcoin doing this? Well, it does it because it's scarce. In this graph, we see the one hour bars and you can see right here where Bitcoin hit $19,950. It dropped down by about $1,000 right after that, but it all has almost recovered all of that and it's now trading at around $19,300. I fully expect that within a very short period of time, whether it's today or very, very soon. Now, that, again, this is my opinion. This is not financial advice, and I am not a financial advisor, but I'm expecting, in my opinion, I think Bitcoin is going to break that $20,000 and quite likely, likely go even higher. So I don't want you to miss this wealth transfer. This could be significant. Now, <clears throat> I don't know what your opinion is of Citibank, but Citibank about a week ago, and this is Citibank, one of the largest, most conservative banks in the United States, but they released an investment report a week ago that says that they think Bitcoin will get to $250,000 by December, 2021. Let me say that again, because I really want to stress it. Bitcoin, according to one of the most conservative banks in America, Citibank, will hit a 10 times increase, tenfold, from $20,000, $19,000, where it's at today, all the way to $250 some thousand dollars. They're guesstimating that it'll be between $200,000 and $300,000 by December of 2021. In one year, Citibank thinks that Bitcoin is going to go up 10x, 10 times its money. Every thousand dollars would become ten thousand dollars. Now, is Citibank the only one? Is Citibank the only one that's saying that? No. 
The, the uh, Deutsche Bank in Germany has said the very, very same thing, but they said it back in August. There's been quite a number of different people who are analysts and who are experts in the field, and they've used something called the stock to flow ratio. And based off of their analysis, they really do expect to see Bitcoin hit two to $300,000 by 2021. Some of them think that Bitcoin will peak at 500,000 before it drops back down uh, to more of a, 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 a a steady level, a level that it holds for long term. And so depending on who you're talking to and what they're basing their information on, there's a lot of people, not just Citibank out there and not just some fly by night, fly by night nut who are expecting and, and talking about a Bitcoin hitting 200, 250, $300,000 by December 2021. So my recommendation, don't just trust me. Don't take my word for it. Go out on the internet, do your own Google search and look that up. Look up what Citibank has told their investors and find out for yourself. It's important. So the wealth transfer is ha happening and here's what will drive the price of Bitcoin up. It's scarcity and demand. So for a minute, we're going to take a look at the scarcity and why Bitcoin and what makes Bitcoin scarce. And then we're going to look at the demand and what makes Bitcoin's demand so high. Now in this chart, this is a chart of how much Bitcoin is mined by miners. But before I get into it, let's talk about gold for a second. What if, and I'm going to change the world. So I'm going to take out my magic wand and we're going to create an alternate reality. In this alternate reality, when a miner goes out and mines gold out of, the, out of the ground, like in the TV program Gold Rush, and they have this heavy equipment that's taking five tons of dirt and running it through a machine to find an ounce of gold. Um, <clears throat> what if every four years, the amount of gold that the miners could pull out of the earth was cut in half? So this year they would get and I don't know the actual ratios. I've watched the program. I don't remember the numbers, so I'm gonna make up some numbers. <clears throat> so let me give you my made up numbers. Let's say the miners pull five tons of dirt and run it through their wash cycle. And out of that five tons of dirt, they get one ounce of gold. But then four years later, instead of one ounce of gold, they only get half an ounce of gold. And what if four years later, instead of half an ounce of gold, they got 0.25 ounces of gold for the same five tons of dirt? That would cause the scarcity of gold to skyrocket. And that is measured by what's called the stock to flow ratio. Well, <clears throat> with the stock to flow ratio currently, <clears throat> currently, when they mine gold, it takes 62 years for them to mine enough gold to replace all of the existing gold. 62 years. Um, with Bitcoin, when Bitcoin was, Bitcoin right now is at this point here. Let me draw a thing around it at 6.25. So every time somebody creates a new block for Bitcoin, and adds that block to the blockchain, that miner gets rewarded 6.25 Bitcoins. Now, when you calculate that out to a stock to flow ratio, just like we have here with gold, that stock to flow ratio for Bitcoin is at 50. So it's very close to the same value for gold. But the interesting thing is, is that in four years, that's gonna drop to 3.25. And then four years after that, it's going to drop to 1.56. And then four years after that, it drops to 7.8. And so right now, the stock to flow is, it takes 50 years. But then with the next uh, halving, it'll take 100 years. And then it takes 200 years. And then it'll take 400 years for the amount of mined Bitcoin to replace the existing supply of Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin is unique in the way that it's programmed to become scarcer 
and scarcer. And so as Bitcoin becomes scarcer and scarcer, it makes it more and more difficult for additional people to be able to get Bitcoin. And so the point is, is that when you're looking at supply and demand, as people are always looking at you, you look at supply and demand to try and figure out the price of something, the supply of Bitcoin is getting less and less and less. But the demand of Bitcoin is actually increasing and going up and up and up. And where we can see the demand of Bitcoin is by the decisions and the whales that are out there. So we're looking at demand, decisions, and whales. So the first place we're going to look is PayPal. PayPal has 300 million customers. Out of those 300 million customers, as of a couple of weeks ago, they have access to Bitcoin. They can now use their PayPal account in order to buy and sell Bitcoin right in their PayPal account. And with 300 million people being able to buy and sell PayPal or buy and sell Bitcoin through PayPal, that's helped to drive the price up because that's increased the demand. The Harvard, the University of Harvard has what's called an endowment fund. Harvard's endowment fund is currently worth 30 billion, that's B with a billion, B, billion with a B, billion dollars, 30 billion dollars. Now they didn't start out that way. In the 90s, the Harvard Endowment Fund was worth a few hundred million, a modest, a modest few hundred million dollars. Well, they've been able to grow that with smart investments into $30 billion. Now with $30 billion, Harvard is able to make some very, they, first of all, they've made some very, very good investment decisions in the recent past that's helped them to get to $30 billion. And so the same people have decided to invest in Bitcoin. In fact, they announced in 1990, uh, I'm sorry, 2018, not 98, 2018, Harvard announced that they were investing in Bitcoin and there was a survey done of 150 other universities, endowment funds, and family offices, large institutions, and what they found when they uh, surveyed those 150 institutions is that 90 plus percent of them are already investing in Bitcoin. And that was 2018, a couple of years ago. So what that tells us is Harvard isn't going to, Harvard's not going to invest millions of dollars into something that they haven't researched out. Now, if you had a team of people researching out on your behalf whether or not you should invest in Bitcoin, they may come up with a whole lot of information. Uh, they could come up with reams and reams of facts and information that would help you make a good decision. That's what Harvard does. They don't just jump in and spend those millions of dollars, invest millions of dollars willy nilly. They take their time. They do their due diligence. They research a topic out. Now you and I, I don't know where I could possibly get access to the research that Harvard had before they invested in Bitcoin, but I can see by their actions what that research led them to do. That research led them to take action to buy millions of dollars of Bitcoin. So if you had that research in your hands, would you have made the same decision? Maybe, maybe you would. Um, now, what about the New York Stock Exchange? The New York Stock Exchange went through a similar exercise, but they did it a lot earlier than Harvard. Well, I can't say that they did it earlier than Harvard did. I don't know how long ago Harvard started their research. But I can tell you that the New York Stock Exchange started their research at approximately sometime in 2015. And in 2015, the New York Stock Exchange was looking into Bitcoin and looking into cryptocurrency. In 2015, if you went to the media to get good information about Bitcoin, good information about cryptocurrency, what did the media tell you? In 2015, what was the mass media telling you about 
Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. They said that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency was rat poison squared. They said that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is only used by criminals, by a terrorist, by bad people, and don't invest in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Well, what happened that the New York Stock Exchange knew something that the media did not know, or was the media, anyway, I don't want to go down that path, I'm going to change the subject. The New York Stock Exchange did their due diligence, they did their research, the New York Stock Exchange teamed up with Microsoft, they also teamed up with Starbucks. The three of them got together and invested $500 million. Let me say that for effect. They invested half a billion dollars to build a cryptocurrency exchange. They built a Bitcoin exchange. Their exchange went live a year ago. And it went live in September of 2019. It's called the BACT exchange, B-A-K-K-T. And in order to use the BACT exchange, you have to be wealthy. You have to be a large player. You have to be investing millions of dollars in order to be a customer on the backed exchange. So what was it that the New York Stock Exchange knew in 2015 that the mass media was not telling us in 2015? Why is it that they invested half a billion dollars to build an exchange if it was rat poison squared and only bad people were using it? Obviously, that was not the case. Now we get to TradeStation. TradeStation and all of these other stock brokerage firms. So not only is this in the New York Stock Exchange, but stock brokerage firms are getting into the act. TradeStation and a host of other stock brokerage firms like Charles Schwab, E-Trade, and uh, TD America, et cetera, et cetera, the list, there's hundreds of them out there. These companies are starting up their own cryptocurrency exchanges so that people can buy and sell cryptocurrency on those stock exchange platforms. Wow, what research were they acting on? And what information did they have that wasn't broadcast by the all-knowing multimedia organizations? What about JP Morgan Bank? You know, it wasn't that long ago that JP Morgan Bank was telling you, uh, the president of JP Morgan Bank came out and said that if I find out any of my bankers are buying cryptocurrency, I'm gonna fire them. And now JP Morgan Bank has come out with their own cryptocurrency and they're also setting things up so that they can custody cryptocurrency. And so you could deposit dollars into a JP Morgan Chase account. And, and when they finally finish their development, you'll be able to deposit Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency into your JP Morgan bank account. Wow. That is a complete turnaround from, if you do it, you'll get fired to we're actually supporting it, building it, hiring people to design the infrastructure in order to custody it, that's a big deal. And JP Morgan Bank is not the only bank out there that's involved with cryptocurrency. There are many, many others. What about MicroStrategy? Now, I hadn't heard, oops, I was trying to, let me move this. I guess it's not hugely important, but I want to do it. There I go. All right, now I can change the shape. What about MicroStrategy? I hadn't heard about MicroStrategy until I heard this story. But MicroStrategy is one of many, many public companies. You can see MicroStrategy right up here at the top of this list. And then this list is a bunch of other companies. There are public companies that are taking their money out of cash. Yes, I said that right. Instead of cash, they're buying Bitcoin. So that when, when here's the explanation that MicroStrategies has given publicly to their investors, 
to their shareholders and to the the business media conglomerates who report on you know what businesses are doing and why they're doing these things so microstrategy has publicly stated the reason why they're transferring their cash from cash US dollars into Bitcoin is because they think that because of all of the money printing that's going on that the value of the dollar is going to drop and they want to get out of the dollar and into Bitcoin instead now that has to make you think because you know um, MicroStrategy is a multi-million dollar, I'm sorry, multi-billion with a big B dollar company. And why is this multi-billion dollar company getting out of cash and getting into cryptocurrency? They've obviously done some research. They've obviously read some facts. And the conclusion they came to is one that says that we should take $700 million of our cash and put it into Bitcoin in order to protect it from inflation on the US dollar. Not only are they the, uh, they're not the only ones that are doing that, but in this list of Bitcoin treasuries, there's a total of $15 billion. I'd like to emphasize that. That's $15 billion with a B dollars worth of money that has gone from treasuries into Bitcoin. And then the last thing that we want to cover is CBDCs. So what is it about central bank digital currencies? Central, CBDC stands for central bank digital currency. And so what we're talking about is like the central bank for the government of China or the central bank for the United Kingdom or the central bank for the Bahamas. And even the central bank for the United States has addressed this, has talked about a central bank digital currency. This would be a cryptocurrency that is created by the government bank for that particular country. Well, China has released this is important. Consider that China has actually released their own central bank digital currency. Why did China create a cryptocurrency if cryptocurrencies are so bad? Why? It, in, in the mind of China, it's an opportunity for them to subvert, and this is my opinion, this is not, I don't have a lot of facts, but we know that China wants world dominance. They want to be the, the dominant player in the world, and they want the Chinese currency to be one of the most dominant players in the world greater than the US dollar. They've beat the US government to creating a cryptocurrency based off of the Chinese government's yawn. So, not only is the Chinese central bank involved, but Russia has been involved with their own cryptocurrencies. Russia is becoming extremely cryptocurrency friendly and a lot of, a lot of the new apps and development and different programs that are going on are coming out of Russia and Russia's development and software teams. Um, we know that Sweden and Germany are uh, setting things up so that their banks can, can hold and custody cryptocurrency. And so if you're a German uh, citizen, you can deposit German dollars or you could deposit Bitcoin into your bank account. Same thing in Switzerland. And so all over the world, there are many, many countries that are involved in creating a digital currency for that country. Australia has a digital currency that's backed by gold. And so this is not just some small phenomenon. It is a worldwide government-led phenomenon and it's growing, it, it, it's growing like crazy. Now, right now, we're at this part of the curve. 
we're way down here at the bottom of the curve. Worldwide, there's probably 5% or so of people around the world that are engaged with cryptocurrencies. At some point, we're gonna be much higher. Now, will we hit 90%? Will we hit 70%? Will we hit 50%? I don't know. It really doesn't matter. The point is, is that we're gonna go through a growth spurt from 5% to 70, 80, 90% of the world using some form of digital currency. And in the process of that growth spurt, we're going to see Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies skyrocket in their prices. And it makes those price predictions by conservative banks like Citibank of 200 to $300,000 sound like they might be possible. It might be possible. We don't want you to miss out. We want you to be able to get involved. So if you have any questions about how you can buy or invest or purchase cryptocurrency, leave it in the comments below. We're also in the process of building, um, I'm gonna be releasing in the next few days, an opportunity for you to be able to create an eToro account and to use eToro's copy trader feature to copy my trades using a computer program I've written and been working on for over two years now to buy and sell cryptocurrency on the eToro platform. So be watching for our next video because that will be featured in the next video. In the meantime, I hope that you'll like, subscribe, and hodl. And hey, do me a favor. Have a fantastic day. Thanks for watching and I really do hope that you'll have a fantastic day.